This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman, as we spend the rest of the hour looking at the ongoing fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, where at least 300 people have died since the violence began two weeks ago. The real death toll expected to be far higher. Russia said both countries have agreed to talks in Moscow, expected to take place today, a sign that a ceasefire may be on the table. French President Emmanuel Macron said the uh, uh, his office said the two countries were, quote, moving towards a truce, but it's still fragile. Nagorno-Karabakh lies inside Azerbaijan, but is controlled by ethnic Armenians. It was the site of a bloody conflict in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Many fear this latest spike in conflict, the world the worst since the 90s, could spark a regional war, with Turkey openly supporting Azerbaijan and Russia allied with Armenia. The Guardian reports Syrian rebel fighters have signed up to work work with private Turkish forces in Azerbaijan, and Turkey is reportedly supplying Azerbaijan with drones and weapons. In an interview with Sky News earlier this week, the Armenian prime minister, Nikol Pashinyan, accused Turkey of continuing its genocidal policies against the Armenian people. It is absolutely not inflammatory language when I say that this is Turkey's policy to continue the Armenian genocide. Let us look at what Turkey is implementing in the Mediterranean, in Libya, in Syria, Iraq. To me, there is no doubt that this is a policy of continuing the Armenian genocide and a policy of reinstating the Turkish Empire. Amnesty International reports Azerbaijan has used banned cluster bombs in civilian areas. Well, for more, we go to Concord, Massachusetts, where we're joined by Anna Ohanian, professor of political science and international relations at Stonehill College. She's the author of Russia Abroad, Driving Regional Fracture in Post-Communist Eurasia and Beyond and Networked Regionalism as Conflict Management. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Professor Ohanian. It's great to have you with us. Uh, this is an area of the world that I believe most people in the United States are not paying much attention to. If you can talk about exactly what's happening, as the foreign ministers of both Armenia and Azerbaijan are now uh, coming to Moscow today, uh, apparently for peace talks. But what has happened? Why has this conflagration grown? Um, thank you very much, Amy, for covering the developments, the violence that is ongoing, the uh, offensive from on the Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, from Armenia, from Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey, coordinated offensive. As you mentioned already, Turkey has come, has been supporting Azerbaijan diplomatically uh, previously, as well as training the Azerbaijani military. But this particular involvement, uh, the specific uh, type of intervention, uh, Turkey's intervention on the side of Azerbaijan is very destabilizing in terms of the support of the, with the mercenaries as well as drone technology. Uh, it creates the conditions of transforming this conflict into a proxy war. But there are two. Uh, it is there are two broad perspectives have been applied to analyze as to what has been going on. More of the more easily understood geopolitical analysis, two-dimensional, what I would call, uh, has been describing has been prevalent and explained explaining this conflict as a resurgence of Turkey trying to enter uh, the South Caucasus as a regional power broker, although Erdogan has been self-proclaiming his foreign policy being neo-Ottomanism, uh, essentially challenging even Turkish uh, territorial boundaries recognized by the Lausanne Treaty. Uh, so the geopolitical uh, analysis also will uh, have us think about this as a confrontation between Russia and uh, Turkey. But I I think this narrative is really missing a lot uh, that is very much under the radar and has not been picked up as much by the international as well, uh, international news coverage. And this, the, the key development here is the domestic, uh, domestic factors driving the foreign policies of these countries, Turkey and Azerbaijan. In particular, what is missing from the discourse is that two years ago, Armenia 
had a, a, a democratic breakthrough, the Velvet Revolution, which was bottom-up, driven by people power, a nonviolent uh, disobedience campaign. And this created, was very significant for South Caucasus because it created a democratic dyad with neighboring Georgia already being uh, a democratic society. Studies uh, in social science and peace research have established that when in a region, uh, democratic poll is strengthened, this creates cause, this creates pressure on the authoritarian poll, in this case Azerbaijan, towards democratization. So this uh, uh, Aliyev regime, uh, that where uh, President Aliyev inherited his seat from his father and is grooming his wife to take over. So Aliyev, for a while, it looked like tried to be a lot more accommodative. Uh, however, within two years, you also see Belarus protests breaking up, and people kept referring to Lukashenko as the last dictator of Europe, um, which is a mischaracterization because Aliyev is uh, the uh, actually <laughs> probably the last uh, dictator of Europe. This Aliyev, instead of really trying to uh, move in that direction, pulled in Turkey. I think per, uh, the democratic dyad between that changed the structure, uh, strengthened the democratic pole in South Caucasus and therefore created an important avenue for mitigating the conflict. This was essentially offset by uh, authoritarian coordination between uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey. So Turkey's entry, I mentioned, changes the structure of the conflict because by bringing in mercenaries from Syria, it does two very important and unfortunate things. It introduces privatization, it privatizes violence in the country. It ex probably this types of state formation conflicts that you see, of which Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is one, they're already hard to negotiate through a negotiated settlement, but they're all also hard to win militarily. So introducing this element, Turkey's change of this, the structure of this conflict is very destabilizing for the region. Now, talk about also, the significance of the foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, going to Moscow today for peace talks. Of course, Putin, we know, is in a basically COVID bunker since March, um, uh, does not see a lot of people. They have to be quarantined for two weeks before they can see him going through disinfectant tunnels, everything like that. But why Moscow? And what do you uh, think will come of this? Uh, I definitely, any uh, push, any diplomatic attention to end the hostilities is welcome news. Uh, I think at this point, the challenge is to end the, the violence. Turkey has been the only country uh, uh, with, among the regional powers, great powers that matter, have, uh, that, that has been uh, pushing for a militarized solution, which uh, would be any militarized solution to the conflict would be a loss for Azerbaijani people as well. Uh, which it would be very difficult to, for Azerbaijani society to move into a democratic path down the road. The Russia's role in particular here, I have to say, Russia has been the grown up in the room. Uh, Russia, contrary to the what I refer to geopolitical analysis that would have Russia, Russia and uh, Turkey clashing, obviously there are tensions. Obviously, Russia and Turkey are in different sides of conflicts in Syria, uh, in Libya, but here, uh, this ha indeed has been Russia's historical backyard since predating the Soviet um, uh, Soviet Union. And what is important here is that Russia has been playing, Kremlin has been playing a very much an institutional role. In contrast to Turkey, it is using all the regional organizations and institutional channels that it created. Um, so while uh, the, the question is whether Kremlin will have enough leverage to uh, uh, to to pressure uh, uh, both sides, I am worried that it's Turkey here is the big factor. Whether uh, Ru Russia's um Pulling in the ministers of foreign affairs of Armenia and, and uh, Azerbaijan is really wonderful. It's important. So right now, but I'm again not sure how Turkish factor will be handled. We just Any have we just have 30 seconds. But you have called sure. Azerbaijan an authoritarian Petra state, and the area we're talking about, Nagorno Karabakh, is a, 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 a is an area of um, of pipelines of oil. This is that air rich oil rich area. Why is this significant? 
This is very significant because, again, from the global perspective, uh, the Economist magazine just issued a very important report that the global capital markets are shifting towards green energy order. So this will be in the, the that report also pointed out, and not surprisingly, that this creates pressure on the petro states to move towards taxation, taxing their citizens, which will require them to engage and build representative institutions. This is a diversionary war uh, on the side of Aliyev that has been domestic discontent has been enormous. And uh, uh, Aliyev has uh, uh, the authoritarianism in Azerbaijan has been nourished by the oil, uh, by, oil by the pipelines. Uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Azerbaijan emerged as an independent country and started to control its oil resources. Unfortunately, we have five the seconds. Military yeah, this uh, authoritarianism, this militarism has not been challenged, and we see this playing out in Nagorno-Karabakh. And we'll, of course, continue to follow this. Anna Ohanian, thanks so much for being with us, professor of political science and international relations at Stonehill College. Uh, her books include Russia Abroad. That does it for our show. Stay safe, wear a mask, save lives. I mean.